Okay, welcome to week 11, uh, ELTE uh, 111 module 11 PC programming. Um, our agenda tonight is similar to what we normally do. We're going to review week 10. We'll lecture on PC programming week 11. And then uh, we'll take a little quiz here uh, of the stuff we covered last week. And then we'll do our lab. Now the lab should be posted. This is kind of a, a shorter lecture, I think. So if you want to get started on the lab here, um, feel free to do so. Um, the outcomes tonight are we're going to talk about Visual Basic programming and programming in general we'll be using Visual Basic and then we're going to learn about the resistor color code um, that's what our lab is about so we'll do a little bit of math and talk about how that work how we can do that with a program. Let's start with our uh, week 11 review. <laughs> so we learned that a relay is an electromechanical switch. Okay so there's different types of um, relays. <clears throat> we were using um, a relay like this and uh, it's an electromechanical switch. It's kind of like a normal switch. You push on the button here and it pulls some contacts. And um, that's different than, you know, this here. This is something that you have to actuate. And it changes the states from uh, on these normally open contacts to closed and these normally closed contacts to open. The relay um, operates uh, with a um, uh, power. You put voltage here at 17 and 18, and that causes the plunger to come down. And what that did is it um, closed one and two and opened three and four and, and like that. So um, basically it's a switch, but it's activated uh, by electricity. Okay. Um, let's come back to here. There are solid state and electromechanical variations. So a solid state relay is something like a, a transistor. Um, there's no moving parts in it. Um, that's something that we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, you might be exposed to that later. What you will be exposed to is the relay that we covered. That's going to be in, in the classes here in the ELTE program. Relays have coils 17 and 18. I just showed you that. That's the coil. You get that power, creates a magnetic field, and then it switches. And the contacts are uh, normally open and normally closed. And it can have multiple sets of contacts. Our relay had a bunch of different contacts, and we created uh, some drawings with those different contacts. Relays are used for latching, so um, we did we talked about that and built a, a little circuit. So a latching circuit is our memory circuit. So that's where we had the um, stop button, and then we had the start button, and that was turning on the control relay. And then we put the holding or the memory contacts here and it created a uh, memory so once again when you hit start it created a path for the power to come here to the control relay and that was 17 and 18 that turned it on and then when that came on it closed these contacts one and two so it kind of turned itself on and then um when we let this up it had a path here <laughs> had a holding contact here and then it, stayed, it kept itself on. So this is referred to as a latch or a sealing circuit or memory or three-wire control. A lot of different, a lot of different options uh, for what that's called there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's used for isolation. We talked about that. That if you had um, a circuit over here where you had um, 17 and 18, and that was the coil, and then over here where you had your switch, which was one and two. Well, these aren't actually wired to each other. They work together through magnetism. So when you give voltage here on this side, it creates a magnet and that magnet pulls the little metal switch over and it closes and then, and then it can close a circuit on that side. And so they're isolated from each other. The left and the right are not wired up. You get a big spike over here it doesn't really burn anything out on this side here. Um, it's used for crosstalk. We'll talk a little bit maybe about that uh, later on in your career here. And it's used for turning on larger voltage with a smaller control voltage. So what does that mean? Well, we could we had 120 volts over here. Our relay was 120 volts. And so that's what was turning on our relay. But on the other side, because this is just a switch, we could have very high voltage like 480 volts let's say turning on a very big motor like you know a motor as big as the desk up here um and then this is a circuit it's got a load it's got conductors it's got a switch and it's got um 
voltage there. So a, a, a small a voltage control circuit can turn on a very large motor circuit. And that's kind of what the lab was a little bit about. We do a picture of that. Um, <coughs> we did a, uh, the three wire controls is referred to a lot of different things. Like I said, sealing, holding, memory, um, a latch, those kind of things. Um, and it had the normally open start and the normally closed stop. So when we look up here again, the normally open start and the normally closed stop. Because once it's energized, you got to have to some way to shut it off. Um, we had uh, the power circuit and the control circuit are different. So we built um, a, a little circuit that had that power circuit. And if you <coughs> will remember from your lab, what we had was um, up top here, we had some set of uh, main contacts that were turning on a motor. And if you remember that this motor was like 480 volts VAC, right? And then you had these contacts here that were turning on that motor. And what were these contacts associated? That they were associated with our stop and our start and our contactor here. And we also we had a contactor here. And then these were contactor um contacts there. So basically there was four. There was one, two, three main contacts, and then there was a fourth contact used for holding or for memory. Okay. So this up here was the power circuit, and this down here was the control circuit. This is the low voltage, 120, and this would be the high voltage, like 480 or something like that. And we had set up a demonstration and showed you how to turn on a motor. And then we talked about using a, a transformer. Um, on there where we picked uh, some voltage off of the high voltage and the transformer brought it down to the control voltage. Still dangerous. <clears throat> um, the power circuit demonstration uh, we had set up before. Um, once again, that's everything that I just described there where the motor starter main contacts close. Um, when it's energized here, close, 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 the motor starts spinning. Okay. And then we picked off voltage off of here through a transformer. These two, there was a tra there was a ice there was a transformer in the middle of your circuit, providing the voltage for the control circuit down there. Okay. Um, <laughs> we had um, control relays. Those are used for logic. And like I said, our our control relay uh, was pretty big. Um, but there's a small ones, and they are used for logic, like used for memory contactors are bigger okay and they had those main contacts for switching the uh, high voltage the, the power circuit but they also have that fourth auxiliary contact and then we uh, hooked up a motor starter and a motor starter uh, was once again pretty big it had uh, main contacts and it also had thermal protection on it and in the motor starters that we had had a variety of different uh, some people had a bunch of different uh, auxiliary contacts normally open and normally closed. So a lot of options there on that motor starter. Um, we did some CAD. Um, so we had a couple of different uh, ways to do CAD and wondering which is better. We had the symbol library where we just kind of copied all the symbols over from left to right. Or what you did this time is you had the insert. You would insert the block and then you kind of built the circuit. Which one was better? Well, it depends on what you, what, on what you like. Um, how was the symbol library developed? Well, basically, what I did is I just uh, inserted the blocks, I inserted a bunch of blocks off on the right, and then that way I could just copy them over really very quickly instead of having to insert them every time. But if you had this memorized, um, you could really probably insert all those symbols quickly. But on the symbol library, they're already there for you. So either way. Um, review of the quiz. So let's take a look at the quiz. You should have that. You can pause this and get it out if you need to. But here is the quiz. The four basic parts of an electrical circuit. We have voltage conductors and, I, and a switch. We talked about needing a switch there and a load. So a lot of people had a load and conductors and voltage worse. But it's always nice to have a switch. And if you were at, at a fifth thing, it might be circuit protection like a fuse. A multimeter is set to continuity. That's when we set it and it goes and we touch the leads and they beep, beep, beep. That means that the circuit is complete. So the multimeter is beeping. That means the circuit is complete. The difference between a momentary and a maintained switch. 
So a momentary switch has a normal state, okay? And so what we did is we hooked up some uh, different things here, uh, like a push button, and this has a normal state. These are open and these are closed. When I, when I push the button, they switch states, and then I let go, and it goes back to the normal position, okay? Versus a, um, a limit switch didn't, you know, it didn't have a normal state. It, it wh whatever you got, uh, the switch win when somebody gave it to you, if it was on or off or off or on, didn't, it didn't matter. It didn't have a normal state. The following logic, one PB and one toggle switch turns on a red light. So everybody pretty much got that one right. So a PB and a toggle switch turns on a light. So that would look something like, uh, we had one PB and, uh, I guess one toggle switch. I, I don't remember if it said turning on a red light, something like that. So one PB and one toggle switch uh, turning on a red light. So we did really, really pretty well with that one. Okay. Um, the difference between a ladder logic rail and a rung. And so a rung contains the symbols and the logic. So we come back to here. Um, these are the rails, L1 and L2. That's my voltage rails, L1, L2, my voltage. And the rung right here contains the symbols and the logic. In this case, we had an AND uh, circuit that we created. Okay, so um, going back to the quiz, uh, pretty basic, did okay on it. Um, we're going to be talking about PC programming now. Um, <laughs> it's uh, the writing of instructions to get something useful out of a computer, I guess. Um, you'll be having an in-class worksheet that uh, you'll want to follow along um, with. So if you, if you go ahead and uh, take that out, we can pause the video if you need to. Um, but it's going to, you know, here's my in-class worksheet. It looks like this. And uh, we'll be working a little bit through it, okay? Um, right here I've got a picture of uh, something from the movie The Matrix. I'll be referencing it a few times here. Um, <clears throat> this is supposedly in the movie computer code that uh, described the world that we were living in. Um, really good movie. You should take a look at it. it, it, it it's, uh, I'm going to use it to describe some computer programming. Hopefully it makes sense to you. Levels of programming. So we have different levels of programming. <laughs> the lowest level is machine language. So machine language uses zeros and ones. And that's because, uh, as we went over, a, uh, a PC uses um, zeros and ones and gates and everything like that in order to um, generate an outcome. So in this case, I guess I, I've got a computer screen and my mouse is moving. Well, really, the CPU's got billions of zeros and ones running through gates to try and uh, generate something here that is very useful, okay? And so we we did some gates. I remember what gates looked like was like um, maybe an an AND gate where we had um, a one and a one. You know, if this was on and that was on, then this returned to one, okay? And then there could be an OR gate. You know, this could run to another OR gate. Um, this was and, and this would be or, and, and this is a zero, let's say, so one, so it's A or B gives me a value here, so one or zero, that's a one, so it gives me more. So just imagine, you know, billions and billions of gates, you know, all wired in together, producing zeros and ones to generate some net outcome, uh, some something useful for a computer. So that's why we're talking about uh, machine language. Uh, but to write out a computer program that was all zeros and ones would be um, would be crazy. You know, that'd be really hard to do. So what we have is the next step up is assembly language. So assembly languages adds um, some commands like add or move or something like this. And what these commands do is they're already pre-written for you where there's all the zeros and ones are kind of pre-packaged for you. So when you when you just bring this in, you don't have to recode it all up. Um, it's already been set up for you. So, but basically, when you get this, you need to assemble this. So, when you once you write your program with these new commands, you got to compile it to get it all the way back to zeros and ones. So it's called you know, you can assembled. Then you have the high-level languages, and these are might be um, like the Visual Basic one that we're using today, um, and they're icons, and these icons represent computer code that um, then needs to be assembled into something that makes 
sense and then needs to be compiled back into zeros and ones all the way back to machine language for the CPU to use. If you look at the levels of programming, here you have your hardware down here. That's your CPU that, uh, that does zeros and ones, gates, electronic gates, billions of them. Your machine language is um, the feeding the zeros and ones, I guess, to the CPU so that it can take inputs and do some uh, logic on them and give you an output. Above that is um, the assembly language, where we're starting to gr group these up a little bit so that it's not um, so complicated to, to ultimately get to zero and ones. And at the very top here, you have like visual languages where you drag in icons. The icons, then, when you get the computer program written, you assemble it, you compile it, and then the CPU runs it. <laughs> so on high-level programming, you might have these visual um, icons that you drag in here. It looks like it's taking some data in, and then it's testing uh, some uh, numbers here, and it's doing a calculate, and, and it's, eventually it's giving you uh, an answer. <laughs> and so on this one, you just kind of drag in these icons, and that's kind of what we're, uh, we're doing here. <clears throat> programming languages. So there's a lot of different programming languages. Some of the earliest ones that were very popular was like BASIC. And now Visual BASIC is an icon-driven version of BASIC, where we put icons on the screen, but behind the icons there is computer code. Okay, so this it's not necessarily that po very popular anymore, but it is pretty easy to understand and to, and to understand how it works. C and C++ are big. Python's one that's very coming up very fast, and um, Java is a, is a big one. Okay, these are big languages. So if you look at the popularity, you see Java, Python's coming up. You don't see Visual Basic on here, but once again, we're going to use that because it's it's something to for you to understand how computers are programmed. <laughs> so it's a third generation event event driven. It uh, works with Microsoft, and so our products here are Microsoft. So that's another good reason to to use it is because we can compile it. And then um, it'll display on our screens, and it'll it'll make sense to us. Okay, and it also leads into our HMI programming of, how, of using object oriented. <clears throat> so you have an in-class worksheet here on um, of uh, programming Visual Basic, um, and what they're doing is we program a sales commission. <laughs> so what you're going to do is, when you get done with this lecture, this this video is posted on uh, D2L. I'd like you to run through the little program of how to uh, program and follow the, the, the worksheet a little commission. Um, it's not uh, too complicated, okay? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start Visual Basic here if I can find it. Here's Visual Studio 2012. I'm going to go ahead and start that. And so what you'll do is you'll do um, a new project. And what you want to do is pick a Windows form application. Don't pick anything else. You're going to be really confused, and you have to start again. <laughs> okay. So when this starts up, you'll see that what it does is it creates, um, you know, your form, and it'll teach you how to um, pin your toolbars here. But here it is. It's visual, so you can put items on the th on the screen here. You want to put a label in there. Bang. There's you just you're starting to code. You're starting to write a program here. You want to put a button. Boom. It's on right there. And when you click this button, behind that is some complicated uh, words and stuff like that. That's the programming that you're doing when you put that on there. Okay, so that's kind of how that uh, that works. You'll see it when you run through the through the uh, little task. So what we're going to do is program development. This is um, we're going to define when you're do, when you're doing something. You're going to define the document, design the document, test the solution, write this, and test and debug. So in here is a little bit of an iteration that you do. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little sales commission. So we got to define uh, and document the problem. So <clears throat> for our little task here, what we're doing is um, going to take a look at sales commission. Um, and we and what we want to do is we want to figure out how to pay everybody correctly, and we want to use a little uh, computer program for that. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the formula sales times a percentage okay and then that is going to be equal to our commission so that's that's what we're solving that is our solution we're going to get um, sales times a predefined percentage and then that will give us how much we pay our salespeople okay 
<laughs> so we're going to design, that's our design and document our solution. So in order to test the solution, what we would do is we could put a few numbers in here um, and say, hey, you know, if you make $100, excuse me, if you make $100 and I'm paying you 10% on that, then you're going to make $10, right? Makes makes sense. So it seems like it, it seems like it would work if we could get a computer program to do that for us. <coughs> um, so we would write and document the program, you know, and then and we'll that's what that little uh, activity that you'll do later does, and then you'll test and debug to be sure it works. So this is a little called iteration, where you test and debug, and then you might kind of have to come back and do some uh, redesign and retesting and rewriting, and then you test and debug. And so these steps might run around a, a few times called iteration until this thing really works like you want it to do. Now, um, maintaining the program is a big thing then. In the, in the case that uh, I like to describe is my, you know, my friends come to me and say, hey, I got a great idea. Do you know anybody who could program this? And then we'll split the royalties or something like that. Um, well, the programmers never want to do this. Um, I had uh, somebody come to me and they got a, they got a great idea. They, they've got this app uh, where you go to the History Museum and instead of, you know, when you walk around the history, you can look at pictures and sometimes it's not that exciting. Well, what they have done is they've uh, talked about that they've got an app where you look at the picture and it starts talking about it and telling you the history of it. But it also starts giving you clues and like telling you a story, a fictional story about that. And then so what you do is you then go to the next picture to get the next clue. And then what you do is you learn about the picture and all the history and everything like that, but you're playing a game when you're at the museum. And you can go to any museum in the world and pull up the little program for the art that they have. Well, it sounds like a good idea, but when you ask the programmer to do it, they say, no way, that's not worth it because maintaining the program is the big thing. Because, you know, when you get your phone, that they push out um, new operating systems all the time and updates. Well, as soon as they do that, it, there's a good chance that that app won't work anymore, or your program won't work anymore, and so you need to know how to maintain the program. Okay, it's very important. Um, <clears throat> so this was the in-class worksheet where we defined um, our, our uh, commission here, and we are going to write the program per the formula, test and debug, and maintain. Okay, so if you need to fill that out, you can. Um, but what we're going to do is, in our in-class, we're going to take um, our sales, that's going to be our input, and then we're going to have a button to calculate, um, we're going to call a subroutine, it's going to do some math, and then it's going to give us our output of what the commission is. So inputs, computer program does the math, and then produces the output, okay? And so when you do this, you're going to read in an input, you're going to do some processing, and then you're going to produce an output, okay? And then when you go to the outputs, what you're going to do is you're going to, once again, you'll take the input, the, the uh, dollar number in and the percentages, and you'll run the math, and then what you do is you will write the output the number that we're going to is in, in a variable name. Okay? So in our in class, we're doing our inputs, our formula, and then we're going to get our commission. Now, an important thing is our variables. Okay? So a variable is a container that can contain a specific value, right? Um, and in this case, it looks like we're putting 1.5. That's our value. Now, 1.5 what? Well, what we have is 1.5, and, and our variable would be called hours, okay? So it's, it's a value, and it's hours. Now, hours, or excuse me, 1.5, needs or hours need to be declared as a real number because 1.5 is a number, and then it's a, it's a real number, so hours gets declared, okay? I'll show you here in a little, in a minute, um, what this looks like. I can pull one open right now. Let's pull open uh, this one right here. My greetings. <clears throat> so, if I take a minute to look at this, I have a little uh, form that you're going to program. Um, but if I double click on here, it pulls up 
all the computer code for this, okay? And so here is what it's talking about when you declare variables. And here some variables are declared as strings, okay? Um, what does that mean? Well, if we go back to here, this variable is declared as a real. There's different types of variables. So if you declare a variable as an integer, that means it's a whole number. There's no decimal point and zeros after it. It's a whole number. If it's a double, well then you're going to have decimals and a decimal decimal point and uh, numbers after the decimal point. Okay. A character is going to be um, <coughs> like a letter or a number, the actual number, and it's often going to have an asterisk. So you take this two right here. This two is not the the the, the a number two. It's the uh, word or, or the uh, symbol to okay there's a difference and a lot of times these would have um parentheses around them when you do that so when you when you were to code that you would write something like um my and then if you put parentheses and put the variable in there sense and then what it would do is it would say my two cents this is my quote two cents if that's what you returned Two meaning it's not a number. We're not using that number to um, do any calculations or anything like that. So that is <coughs> going to be called a character. A string, well, that is called this is a string. Okay? So once again, if, if you use something that's all written out, you would probably put it in parentheses, and I'll show you in a minute, and it would be a, a, a sentence. That would be a string that you could declare as a variable. And then there's Boolean, which is true or false. You know, that's the simplest, like um, if something is uh, one or zero, high or low, low, yes or no. Okay. So if I come to here and I look at <clears throat> a little bit of my code here and try and figure out what is going on, I can see that um, I'm dimensioning S name as a string. And, and, and it says person's name. Whenever there's a little apostrophe right there like that, that means that's just for informational purposes. So up here too, that's for informational purposes. It will not run this as computer code because of that. This stuff will get run as computer code because it doesn't have a parentheses in front of it. Okay, so it's dimensioning greeting as a string. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it looks like it's got different greetings in here and, and it wants a name. So if I come up here and hit start, Let's let it start, and I type Sean, and I click display greeting. It says, hi, Sean. Okay, well, let's find out why that is. We look here, and apparently um, it is <laughs> taking hi somewhere. I see it in parentheses, hi, and it's putting the greeting. So it's hi, and then parentheses here is going to be my net s name explanation point so hi sean explanation point something like that is what is going on with this computer program here okay um define variables <laughs> so you use a dimension statement to de define the variables it starts with a letter try to make it descriptive and be descriptive with the name style so you have to dimension what kind of variables you got so once again this is a string de string declared for the Putting your name and hitting the, greet, the greeting. Sean um, is a string. Um, this good evening, guten Ben, You know these are words. So these would be dimensioned <coughs> as a string. The type of greeting here as a string. And then it looks like it's trying to, you know, good evening, um, guten Ben is German. That looks like Japanese there. That's how it's how it's returning these. Okay. So on that, what it does, it, it, we hit start, we were playing, it got the name, my name. This was a subroutine here <laughs> that was doing a little, that was doing what we told it to, and then the output was to, to display the greeting, hi, Sean, okay? So now we're going to talk about subroutines and functions. So a subroutine is, is something that kind of takes in ver uh, input and uh, performs a task, and a function may take in 
variables and return a value, okay? So a subroutines are functions. These are computer programs that are running within computer programs when they're called. They're there. They don't run unless you call them. But if you call them, then they're going to then they're going to run, okay? So if I go back to my um, Matrix example, I hope you've seen the movie. So what Matrix was was a big computer program here called the Matrix, and this was the world. It was a fake world. It was a computer programmed world, okay? And inside of this, um, there was some characters. There was this this bad guy called Agent Smith, okay? <laughs> and Agent Smith's job was to try and kill a character called Neo, okay? And if you've seen it. Agent Smith would not be around. Then all of a sudden he would be, he'd, he'd pop up and he would try and kill Neo. Okay, then when he didn't, uh, that didn't occur, he would disappear again. So Agent Smith was a subroutine. He was a program that was available to run, but he did not run unless uh, he was called. Okay, and then there was other uh, different subroutines like called the Oracle, and every once in a while that subroutine would run to give uh, Neil some advice and everything like that. And so they had all these programs within the program, the, the big program, um, that would be called and they would occasionally run depending. So that is what is a subroutine is, okay? So <laughs> once again, a subroutine is a set of re related instructions to do a, a specific task. In this case, it was to kill Neil, right? And you may or may not receive a return value. Versus a function is um, something that you might do some math in here. Um, looks like they're doing a little calculation here that you're going to take some input, you're going to run the subroutine, and then you're going to output the data, okay? <laughs> so let's take a look at my at our programming example again, okay? <clears throat> so once again, what we're doing is we're going to take, we're trying to return the greeting and this string and explanation point. So when I click that button, it calls this subroutine, get greeting, okay, as a string. And it's going to say, okay, if good evening is picked, then it sets the greeting type as good evening, and that gets chucked up into here. If it's guten abend, then that string guten abend gets chucked up in there and if it's kanban moi that gets chucked up in here and it sells it's this this and it says else that means if nothing else is selected it just puts high up there so it says hi sean okay so that's kind of the way that looks like this is reading here okay so if i go ahead and i run this again and i type sean and i i didn't pick any of these so I, it says hi sean that's what we figured but now if I go good evening and I display greeting, it says good evening, Sean, because that's what it did. Or if I type this one, for example, display greeting, there it is, Kanban was Sean, okay. And once again, what do you think is going to happen there? Display greeting. Oh, wait a minute. It says hi, Sean. It should say guten abend, Sean, but it says hi, Sean. Okay, let's look into that. So what we have here is um, we have... Guten Abend. That's a capital G. That's a capital A. If I go into here, this is a capital G, and it's a smaller case A right there, capital G. So this is literal. It has to be exact. So even though you wrote Guten Abend because you wrote capital A, then that is a different uh, value than upper and lower case and therefore it did not execute this case it did the else it just returned hi sean so when you code this stuff up it needs to be perfect any any spaces or any errors it's going to tell you and you're going to have to look really really hard to try and find out what is going on here okay so that was our programming demo there <clears throat> we got the name we picked the language we ran the subroutine and then it displayed the greeting okay so this type of programming is called object-oriented. So when we put that text box in, <laughs> um, it puts a lot of attributes with it. So in here, let's take a look at um, maybe in the form of a car. So when you buy a car, it's got a lot of different things about it, okay? So, you know, just like when you put a text box in, there's a lot of attributes, methods, and events about it. A car's got a lot of different things related to it. So 
if you were putting a car in, in the context of computer programming, it would have a body style. And so you'd have a car dot body style and you could have a two door and a six cylinder and, and it would drive straight. That would be the method. Uh, the events would be to turn on the key. So what does that mean? Well, if you take a look at <clears throat> these things here like this, over here is all the items that are associated with this your appearance and your behaviors and your date and design focus all the information related to that button are there you put in a text box here once again there's text box one and it's going to have all these features and attributes that you would set and basically when you change these your computer programming you're creating what is going to come up when you run your program okay um, next is the resistor color code. <laughs> so we're going to take a look at the color code. You have this in your um, packet, I believe, and it's posted on D2L. So the way that um, the resistor color code works is <laughs> there's uh, we're using a three-band resistor. And so um, we're going to examine a resistor that is brown, black, brown, silver. Okay. So the first band corresponds to the brown. And I say the first band is brown so I get a 1 okay so if I come over to my resistor color code I'm gonna get a 1 okay I look at the next one the second color band is black so that's 0 okay so I'm gonna go and put a 10 there 1 0 I've got 10 okay now <clears throat> I'm going to the third color band which is brown the third color band is the multiplier. Okay, so it's brown. I got one zero, and then I got a brown here, so it's one. So it's times ten. Okay, so what this is saying is it's one zero times ten, and that's a hundred ohms, right? That's what that's the way that that's looking. Okay, hundred ohms. Now, the next band is the silver, and the silver is the tolerance. So it's plus or minus 10%. So we have plus or minus 10%. So if it's nominally 100 and we multiply by 1.1 or 1.10 because that's 10%, that gives me 110 ohms. And if I take 100 and I multiply it by 90 because that's 10% less, it's plus or minus 10%, I get 90 ohms. So once again, the nominal is 100 ohms, okay? So anywhere between 90 and 110 ohms, it would be this resistor. If for some reason I measure the resistor at 93 ohms, that's a good resistor because it fits between these two. If for some reason I measured 89 ohms, guess what? It's not a good resistor. It's out of the tolerance range, okay? So 93 ohms would have been a good one. And that's how that works. Okay. Percent error. <clears throat> now, how much of an error is this resistor? Okay, that's the next thing to figure out. So what it what we're gonna do is it requires the absolute value. So it's the absolute value means that you're gonna subtract two and you're going to make it po positive. So it's measured minus nominal. So if I come over here. If we say, we just said it, we said we measured 93 and it was supposed to be 100 and we're taking the absolute value of that and then we're dividing it by the nominal and then we're multiplying by 100 to get percent. So if we divide this by 100, we get, remember 93 minus 100 is negative 7, but it's absolute value. So we get 7 over 100, okay? is equal to 0.07 but we multiply it by a hundred to give me seven percent is the error there and that kind of makes sense because it's supposed to be a hundred but it was 93 and so it was seven percent error this one happens to work out because it's a hundred and it's really easy but that is the formula for percent error and I think on your in-class worksheet if you'll take a look it says calculate the value of the resistor given to you. So you're going to be given a resistor right now. You can work this through. You're going to take the um, 
the color code, the first two, the first two on your color code are going to be, um, you know, 42 or 26 or 72, whatever those two are. And then you're going to multiply it by the third band. So if it's 44 times 40,000 or 57 times 1,000, this is a multiplier. And that's going to give you your um, your value there. Okay. And then what you're going to do is, let's say um, I had 44,000, whatever, 44 times 1,000, and I had a 10% resistor. And so what would I do again? I would go... <laughs> 44,000 times 1.1 and 44,000 times 0.9 and that gives me the high and that will give me the low the high and the low right there okay times 1.1 and times 0.9 so then what you're going to do is you're going to measure it put it on the multimeter and you're going to get a you're going to measure it. Let's say you get 43,729. Okay. What will you do? You'll subtract 44,000 because that was the item. And you're going to make absolute value. And then you'll divide by 44,000 to get your answer. And then you'll times all that by 100. That will be the percent error that your resistor is off. Okay, so that was your percent error again. So you can take a few minutes and uh, work through the resistor that the instructor gives you. Okay. <clears throat> Next, we're going to take a look at Ohm's law. Ohm's law states that the current through a conductor between two points is directly proportional to the voltage. So, or in other words, voltage is equal to current times resistance, right? So, we have possibilities of rearranging this. We have V equals I times R, because this is a multiply line. This is the divide line. We, if, we, if we're given voltage or resistance, we can get current by I is V over R. Or we, if we have a V and I, we can get resistance. Resistance equals V over I. It's just moving this around. And so the in-class worksheet asks you to calculate the current fl flow through the resistor. Okay. And so I'm going to do uh, one for you um, real quick. And let me see. Let's say, let's work with... Um, the one that we just did. So what we, um, I said we measured one at 93 ohms, right? And it says it wants um, the current flow. So I'm looking for I, that's that's my value I'm trying to find. And the 24 volts is what we know. So it looks like I've got resistance and voltage. Resistance and voltage. If I come back to here, let's see, I got it right here. I is equal to V over R, because these are the two that I have. I equals V over R. So if I come right here, I is equal to V over R. So it would be 24 volts over 93 ohms, which is about, looks like at about 0.26 amps, something like that. I'm just guesstimating. So that's how you would get how much current but what you can do is you can calculate the flow through the resistor that you have we can leave this up on the screen for a minute if you want to take a look at your numbers okay um <laughs> so the resistor color code we're going to um create a layout and we're going to write code to solve for the resistor color code so here is um the resistor bands it's going you're going to enter the resistor bands and then you're going to have um the lab is going to run a subroutine here to convert these strings and and to uh, uh, values and then print it with ohms. Okay. So if I come and I look at um, my, let me see what I got here. If I can programming lab, let's try this. Let's <laughs> pulling it up again. So this is what comes up. This is my screen that I built. And behind there, I've got a lot of code. Look at it. it's got my values here for my, my multipliers, depending on the, the color and the functions and everything. Well, there's a lot of stuff to type here. You have to type it perfectly, or else it's going to mess up. So here's my dimension. It looks like I'm dimensioning the color as a string because the word brown is not a number. 
but my dimension, my resistor value, is an integer because that is a number. Okay, so here's I dimensioned my items. I've got um, some resistor low. I'm taking some values and multiplying by 0.9 and 1.1, generating some some information there. Okay, so if I come up here and I hit start, um, we said that it was brown, black, brown, right? And if I click show resistance, it says the resistance is 100 ohms. That's what we said. The high is 110. It says high value is 90. Shouldn't this say low value? It looks like there's a problem here. If I go back into the code, um, we have to find out wh why that is. So somehow it's printing out um, that. Let's find it. Oh, it's right here. Text box 3 should say low value, I think. Oh, let's try that low value and if I go back and run this again and I go oh, brown black brown I think it was boom low value is 90 ohms okay so there you go that's um, change that string to produce the low value plot it plus it put in the value in there plus quote ohms and it generated that so that is going to be the uh, program that you guys are going to write there okay and basically the way that it worked was we got the color bands we ran the subroutine here the function in this case and then it just dis displayed the resistor value okay um variable declaration do a good job don't mess it up or you'll have to you'll be retyping trying to find it uh your button click you get your bands and you convert your color band okay so what we have is a, a quiz in lab, but it's actually this. I'd like you to go online and watch the short video about how to do the sales commission. Show the uh, instructor that you have completed the sales commission activity, and then you can take your quiz and you'll staple your in-class worksheet um, to the quiz. And if you get done, if this gets done early, you might want to take a look at your lab and uh, get started on it early today. You might uh, be able to get some of that coded in. So. Uh, that's what we had for today.